Okay, so now I would like to describe to you how to construct a cohomology basis that respects the Hodge filtration. So first, let's introduce a top form on the ambient space. So I will call it volume form, so vol, and it's defined like this. You take a sum, so overall variables from i equals 0 to n plus 1. So xi times, now I'm going to write a form a top form, so an n plus 1 form. So this will be dx0, which dx1, which dx2, etc. Except when you get to dxi, you don't put it there. You omit it and then continue with dxi plus 1 and so on until you get to the last thing, which is dxn plus 1. So just to clarify the notation, let me give you a few examples. For example, the volume form for p1, n equals 0, will be x0 dx1, so dx0 here was omitted, i equals 0, I have x0, dx0 is omitted, minus x1 times dx0, and now I omit dx1. Let's do one more. This one is x0 dx1 dx2 minus x1. Okay, so you get the idea. And uh, the reason I called it the volume form is because if you restrict to, to an affine chart where xi is invertible, let's say, then it becomes the standard volume form on an affine chart, on an affine space, uh, up to sign. So let me write this down. So on, let's say, the locus where xi is invertible, I can set xi to be 1. These are homogeneous coordinates, so I can, I can arrange this to be true, and then naturally dx1 be becomes 0. So if you want, think of think of this quotient map here. I'm taking this affine plane here where the xi coordinate, the i coordinate is set to 1. And naturally dxi from the ambient space here would restrict to the 0. And then you map to d plus xi. Well, that makes our understanding of the volume form very easy because except for the i term in this sum, uh, every other edge product will have dxi, since dxi becomes 0, every term except this i term vanishes. In other words, the volume form restricted to here, well, with this identification becomes, and at least when i is even, of course, that becomes, that's the volume form on the affine chart, d plus xi, it's like so, so this is the wish product of those coordinates, and you need the sign for compatibility's sake, and for the sake of pedantry, let's restrict this volume form over here to d plus x0. Now dx0 vanishes, and dx0 is 1, this is dx1. Now volume form of p2, this gives me dx1, dx2. Okay, so let me tell you why this is essentially the best thing you can choose for a, as a volume form on pm plus 1. So this is unique up to sign. Well, of course, I can scale it too, but it is this particular choice is well defined over the integers. So we've been working over the complex numbers, but in principle, these things make sense over the integers. And this really is the, uh, the best choice and the unique choice up to sign. So let me say where that comes from. So this is either called the dualizing sheaf or equivalently, sorry, this is a one. So this is the, the sheaf of homomorphic top forms on P and plus one, sometimes denoted by this little omega. This thing is isomorphic to the line bundle of degree minus n minus two and I can make this isomorphism and essentially an equality if I multiply it by a particular element, and that particular element is this top form that I've written upstairs. So that thing is a metamorphic section of this, it will have poles. So once you twist it minus once you twist it n plus two times, then the generator of this line bundle will be the volume form. At least up to scaling, this is why. This form has some significance, and as I said, the change of choice of coefficient is natural. 
Okay, now we're ready to translate this volume form into a form on our hypersurface X. So to this end, we're going to define this space, let's call it gamma F and L. L is some positive integer. So remember, F is the equation defining our hypersurface. And this is going to be, well, it's going to be a vector space of some polynomials P times the volume form divided by F to the L. So P is a polynomial, it's a homogeneous polynomial and designed to make this expression homogeneous. That means if I scale the variables x, x0, x1, etc. by a lambda, then this expression should not scale. Should, this should be invariant. And that happens if you look at it. If you scale xi, dxi will also scale. So this thing has degree of homogeneity which equals the number of variables at each stage. That's n plus 2. So that has a degree of homogeneity at n plus 2. So when you scale it by lambda, when you scale the variables by lambda, this is going to spit out lambda to the power n plus 2. f has degree d. So this thing expression has a degree of homogeneity ld. So p has to be of degree l times d minus n minus 2. So obviously this vector space is just isomorphic to this vector space of homogeneous polynomials of that degree. So here's how we relate this expression to x. So note that these are top forms on Pn plus 1 with a pole along x, the polar locus of x but with a pole order. And so what we do is we're going to associate the residue of these forms and the residues will be living in the polar locus. So let's see how we're going to do this. So for every L, so there's a natural residue map, which I will describe in just a second, which I will call residue sub L for now. And we're going to divide it so that it's going to land in the cohomology of X. We'll see later that it actually lands in the primitive cohomology. So there are a few more properties of this map, but let's just define the map first. This is, we're going to define the map by the following identification. Remember that this cohomology is dual to homology. So to give a cohomology class is equivalent to defining a function, a linear function, that eats a homology class and spits out a number. So here's how we do this. Let's take form eta. So eta will look like this, but we don't use it just yet. And the function that I produce from eta is the following. I take any gamma homology class. I'm going to, I would like to define an integral uh, over gamma, but I can't. It has a pole along x, gamma lives on x. So what you do is that you construct a tube around gamma that lies entirely in the complement of x. Again, I will do draw more pictures. So that, imagine this is a tube, an S1 bundle over gamma, and then you integrate eta over this S1 bundle. Okay, so let's draw a picture first. I think the idea you want to have is if you were to think of C and you have a point, say the origin, and for a moment, let's say X is this point. So if you work with N equals zero, a few things don't work very well uh, with this picture. So let's not take N equals zero. It's unnecessarily complicated, even though it's supposed to be super simple. But nevertheless, if x was a point, what I want from gamma is that it has to be this point, and then tau of gamma will be a circle. So that's the tube around a point. So that's an S1 bundle over a point, and that's a single S1. Of course, that's how you compute residues in single variable complex analysis. So your eta will have a pole, and integration around the circle will give you a pole. So that's a number when you have a single variable. It turns out that when you have higher dimensional varieties, the residue is a differential form, not a number. And the reason here it's a number is that when the dimension is zero, you're working with h0, and indeed h0 can be represented by constant functions at a point, which is a number. Okay, so now let's do this higher dimensional thing. Let's say my x is a caricature that looks like this. Obviously, x will have a very high dimension, Here's a trick. So if I take 
any point x here, normally you think the normal direction is a single line. But we're working with complex variables, so really the complex line is a complex line. Remember, there is, there is room for such a thing. And the reason there is room for such a thing is that x is a complex codimension 1 object in Pn plus 1. So it has real codimension 2. So there's two dimensions of space to move. And that's what this complex line is doing. This complex line, the normal, the normal line of x at this little point, little x, can be at least locally embedded into Pn plus 1, so it intersects x only at the origin. So a neighborhood of 0 here could be embedded so that it doesn't intersect and it's orthogonal to the tangent space of x. But that means I can take a circle here. There is enough room for that and by a small tube I mean the radius of these circles should be so small that it, basically you can contract it to x without intersecting any other point of capital X. And when you have a cycle inside of x, so that's essentially you can think of it as a sphere of dimension n. It wouldn't be a huge mistake to do this. And then you're constructing an S1 bundle around this n-dimensional sphere inside of x. Of course I cannot draw this, but maybe it would look... a part of it would look a little bit like this. Of course gamma is supposed to have no boundaries, therefore t of gamma also no, have no boundaries, so this thing sort of goes out. These things become hard to draw, but at least in principle it's a very explicit construction. And now what Griffiths proves is that the Hodge filtration here corresponds to the pole order L over here. We can describe the cohomology on the right hand side completely by these differential forms on the ambient space with uh, certain pole orders. That means I can describe the cohomology and the Hodge filtration using essentially polynomials of certain degrees. We've done this for curves already. This is a slightly more sophisticated version of it. Okay, now let's write the main theorem that I've been leading up to. This is due to Griffiths, and just like all the other references, the reference will be in the info box below. So the first thing first is that this residue map surjects to the following part of the filtration. So you, you go to n minus l plus 1 filtration, piece of the filtration of hn of xc, but you need to use the primitive cohomology. So this tube operation ends up killing the hyperplane class. And it's kind of annoying, but as l increases, the filtration decreases, so the orders are opposite. So this is this surjectivity part. In particular, and, and this is super important, if you go all the way up to L equals N plus 1, then this thing surjects to F0 of Hn, which is everything. So that means you can represent all primitive cohomology classes using forms of pole order at most N plus 1. Another useful remark here is that if you use only forms of pole order 1, they're kind of special, so they're the nicest in some sense. The reason is about to come in a second. Well, first of all, following from the second item to come, this is not only a surjection but an isomorphism to Fn of Hn x c0, which actually is precisely so, regardless of this primitive that kills a higher order piece. It removes something from a higher order piece. It doesn't interact with Fn. So it ends up being the original Fn of Hn, which was the sheaf of uh, global sections of the sheaf of holomorphic forms on X. So that, that's now super nice. We've used this for curves already, where n was 1, obviously. So holomorphic forms on X admit this very special representation with forms of polar order 1. Okay, so then Next item says uh, which of these residue terms are essentially redundant. So what do I mean by redundant? So we would prefer to have something of lower pole order whenever we can. So if I take the residue and I end up in the smaller piece of the filtration, I could have used a smaller pole order to represent it. So the statement is that if 
So if I take an element from this gamma fl and its residue is in a smaller piece of the filtration, n minus l plus 2, let me omit this hn, etc. So then p is inside the Jacobian ideal of f. Remember, this is the ideal generated by the derivatives of f. Moreover, this is an if and only if condition. So if p is inside the Jacobian, then the con converse holds, the residue is inside this smaller piece of the filtration. I would say conversely. In particular, this handles the kernel issue because if something is zero, then for sure it's inside also the smaller piece of the filtration because zero is inside the smaller piece of the filtration. Therefore, this is a very simple check to realize which polynomials will give us new elements beyond those coming from the old filtration. So let me then summarize this in a more practical way. How do you find a basis that respects the Hodge filtration? Well, here it is explicitly. So we take P1, P2, etc. to Pm prime. Remember, M prime is the dimension of the primitive cohomology. So let these be homogeneous poly polynomials, so have possibly different degrees, of course, such that they descend to a basis of this following ring, but not, not, not of this ring exactly. I'm going to take pieces of this ring, and you will not be surprised that I take the piece LD minus N minus 2, so the homogeneous part of this degree, and I need to sum over L equals 1 up to N plus 1. So then, so again, if taken in appropriate order, so ordered at least in non-decreasing degree, then that will work. So these residues, so here I take the obvious residue corresponding to uh, each of the polynomials. So pi has some degree, that degree will require a certain pole order to make this thing homogeneous. I called it li, I take the appropriate residue. We don't usually write this residue li anymore, just you understand which one it is. And these things form a basis for this primitive cohomology respecting the Hodge filtration. Let me do one example that I already alluded to. So when L equals 1, then the generators of the Jacobian have degree d minus 1. Therefore, when I look at terms of degree d minus n minus 2, I will have only the terms coming from here, so nothing can be killed by the ideal. So the So that this quotient is equal to this one. And we already alluded to the fact that this is Fn of Hn. And these are global holomorphic forms. So there, not only did we find global holomorphic forms, a very simple representation of them, but in fact, we can compute their dimensions, the dimension of the space. So this thing has dimension So this thing has dimension d minus 1 choose m plus 1. So in general, it's the degree plus the dimension of the projective space, choose the dimension of the projective space. So that's the general formula. Right, so this gives me the dimension of this. So one thing I would like to say is that the basis that I've given here, even if you don't compute the periods, is uh, quite valuable. So it allows you to study infinitesimal deformations of x as an, algebraic, as an abstract variety. And it was actually this construction that allowed Donaghi to study the Torelli theorem for hypersurfaces. Even this construction is uh, very valuable. Well, okay, for curves at this point, I did not use this residue expression. I was able to cut down two form in P2 to a one form in P2, and then I just pulled it back to the curve. So you can always do this, but it is actually uh, only a local construction. So we've also done this with the curve. I worked with an affine chart and on that affine chart I was able to simplify it. So what happens here is that the residue uh, admits a purely algebraic description which roughly translates to the following. So res so divides out by an expression of the form df over f. So df is a one form and so here you engineer uh, df over f, sometimes you can do this locally, 
and you delete this d of over f to by maybe multiplying by 2 pi i. So that what residue does is deleting that df over f, you're left with a form that's not an n plus 1 form, but an n form. And then you restrict it to x. So that's, that's another interpretation of res. And this was what I used when x was a curve. Now, again, with the situation of curves, I was able to compute the integrals directly. So now we're out of luck. So representing the homology basis is in general difficult. If you actually want to compute periods of hypersurfaces, then uh, you can go to my GitHub page here. There's a magma slash sagemath package called period suite, and you download this package. There are instructions for installation, and at least for small polynomials of small degree, let's say quartics, it should be uh, fast enough. Try it out with surfaces of degree 4 and with few monomials. So that should work. In principle, the algorithm works for every hypersurface of any degree in any dimension, but, um, but your computation may never terminate. And of course, there's an article attached to it. You're welcome to look at it. The idea is to use the Griffith basis for cohomology, but to cheat and not use a homology basis explicitly and uh, use techniques involving deformation of X instead. Okay, so this is where I would like to finish the lecture. Congratulations on making it all the way to the end.